Good morning, TABC. My name is Genevieve Lowry, and I get to bring you all the announcements this morning. And first off, we just want to welcome everyone who's here in person and online. We gather together to worship God, to be formed by him, and to be sent out on mission for him. And we're really excited that you are spending this time with us this morning. It's just so great to have you. I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas yesterday. Um, first off, also, way to be here on time. Um, at 10 a.m., way to remember, um, normally we have two services, but this week we're at 10 a.m., and the first thing I want to let you know is next week we're also going to meet at 10 a.m., and there's only going to be one service, so make sure that you're here at the right time, or um, you're just going to be confused because you'll come in and no one will be here, or you'll come in and Garen will be in the middle of the sermon. So 10 a.m. next week also, keep that in mind. Um, Oh, yeah, and then the next thing I want to let you know is January 14th through 16th, we're having a parenting conference, and this is really exciting. It's not just for parents. It's for anybody who has influence on children's lives, so maybe if you're a Sunday school teacher, um, a teacher, if you're, like, I'm an older sister. I have a lot of influence on my younger siblings' lives. Maybe you work at summer camps. Just anyone who has influence on children's lives, this is going to be a really good conference for you to go to. It's only $20 for... Um, the whole thing, and for it's $20 per family too. So $20 per family that comes with two meals and a book. So this is a really great thing for you to be a part of if you have time January 14th through 16th. You can register for the conference on the TABC app or also on the website, or I think there's also a place at the information desk back in the corner that you can go to to register as well. And then, um, oh yeah, and then last, thank you so much for uh, supporting Navidad con Jesus, and thank you for supporting Cookies for Truckers. Um, yeah, just this is a really great season where we remember what God has done to serve us, how he gave himself for us. And so a great way to celebrate that is by giving of ourselves and our resources that he has blessed us with to others. And so um, thank you all for your support of that. That was really awesome. I don't have exact numbers for the Navidad con Jesus bags, but it looks like you all brought in quite a few. So thank you for that. And then Cookies for Truckers. Um, our goal was to have 70 plates of cookies, and everyone brought in 101. So way to just go above and beyond. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, that is all I have for you this morning. So if you would stand with me, we will pray. Um, Lord, thank you so much um, just for the wonderful um, season that we have where we um, spend a little bit of extra time just um, remembering what you have done for us, how you came from heaven, you came out of perfection into this broken world where we live um, to be with us and to make a way for us to have um, a right relationship with you again. I thank you so much for the work that you did on the cross. Um, and God, I thank you so much that we get to worship together. Um, thank you for this beautiful day and for everyone that you've brought together. And I just ask that you would um, prepare our hearts just really worship you together and lift your name high. It is in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Let's join together in singing Joy to the World.
just want to welcome you guys here again. Just thank you for being here. It's a joy to be together. We have so much to celebrate, no matter what season of life we're in, even if we're in the season of Christmas. We're all in different seasons of life, and we're just celebrating the one who came, who was incarnate, God made flesh, and experienced everything that we do. So whether you're full of joy today, Jesus knows how that feels. Whether you're burdened with whatever, uh, family struggles or strife, or your life's just not going how you expected, you have disappointment, or maybe you're kind of bored with your faith, uh, whatever you're going through, Jesus knows, and he cares. And so that's who we're worshiping today. If this is your first time here, we want to especially welcome you. We have an information center in the back desk. Just stop by there and connect with us. We would love to get a little bit more information on you and your life and be able to partner with you in your journey. I want to read for us from John chapter 1. It says, In the beginning there was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him, and nothing was made without him. In him there was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered it. The darkness has not overcome and will not overcome. This is who we worship today, the one who suffered for us because of his great love. So let's continue on in worship.
We celebrate Jesus because of the gift he gives us, and I just want to give us an opportunity to give him a gift back. And so can we sing that verse 3 one more time and just think and ask the Lord to show you what in your heart could you give him for Christmas this year? And when we bring our incense gold and more, we bring him our gifts, we bring him our praise, we bring him our hearts. That's what he wants. It's just the deepest part of us. So let's sing that again one more time. So bring him in since gold and Jesus, we just thank you for the gifts that you've given us. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your faithfulness and obedience to the Father and your rescue plan for us. We just celebrate you and worship you. We want to give you all of us. That's our gift to you this year, Lord. Our lives, our work, our play, our dreams, everything, our families. Lord, they're yours. Everything good that we have is from you anyway. We just worship you and we open our hearts to the truth of your word. The word made flesh, we get to hear it now preached. God, just help us to hear and listen and take it to heart and obey in joy. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Scott Waters is going to do our mission moment this morning. Mitchell's, right? talking about the Mitchells, so thanks for helping us out. Good morning. Uh, as Garen mentioned, our, our mission's focus is Russ and Kathy Mitchell. They are with uh, OC, International Overseas Challenge, and I think they just recently passed 25 years with OC. Um, like many of our missionaries, they have a, a connection to 12th Avenue. Uh, Kathy was from the Council Grove area and uh, came to Emporia State, and I believe she was uh, friends with Steve and Lisa Lowen um, during their time at Emporia State. Um, shortly after the fall of communism in Romania, uh, Russ and Kathy went there to plant churches and to equip the national believers and they had a, uh, a fruitful ministry there for about 15 years. And then they returned to the States about 10 years ago and um, are now living in Upland, Indiana. And uh, Russ has had several positions with OC and most recently he has become their director of training for their missionaries. And he works uh, closely with Atabauk who um, specifically 
um, helps prepare their missionaries to, to move to the field. Um, I just received a card from uh, Russ and Kathy a couple of days ago, and uh, they will be going to Central Asia on January 3rd. Um, Russ teaches missions courses for Taylor University. It's a Christian liberal arts university there in Upland. And I think uh, in connection with him teaching the missions course uh, for the last couple of years, he's taken groups of students over the, the uh, Christmas semester break. And so they'll be leaving January 3rd and be there for most of the month um, in, in Western um, or Central Asia. Um, it is a, a closed area of the world to traditional missionaries that they'll be going to. And so they specifically ask that uh, we pray for unity as they develop uh, relationships both among their team and then the people that they'll be um, going to. That we, we are led by the Spirit to convey the gospel in a sensitive way. That hearts will have understand that we will have understanding hearts and open minds um, as they uh, try to engage in gospel conversations, and that through it all, of course, that God will be glorified, and um, that He's preparing hearts to to receive the good news. Very good, Scott. So we want to take this moment, as always, we talk about things that God is doing through this body, locally and also around the globe. Um, really exciting stuff. You guys, you and Brian both went, Hollenbeck, and didn't Jason also, Holland, Jason Hubner also went? Yeah, so it's been a really cool partnership, and so... Um, God is at work, and we just take this moment, since, again, we can't pass offering plates right now, we're not doing that, to, to remind ourselves that worship is not just singing songs, right? Worship is how we live our lives, it's our generosity, it is talking to God, it is the times of prayer, time of prayer we're going to have in a minute, it's fellowship together, um, it's hearing the word, it's responding to the word. And so, um, as we kind of said this whole Advent season, the whole message of Advent is that God is a generous God who, is, who gave everything for us. And so we should be generous people who are willing to give everything to him and generous in all things, in our attitudes, our words, and in our giving. Paul says in Philippians 4, 18 and 19, he says that your gifts are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So he's like, be generous and I'll take care of you because being generous is what reflects me well to people. So we want to take that minute. I know as people came in, you had the chance to give in the giving boxes. We really want people online to have that chance, that space to give. And so we take this minute, right? We pray silently. And I actually, this may be the best part of the service for me, just that chance to sit in silence and to, to talk to our father. And so pray for the Mitchells, pray for any other things that are on your heart. Um, pray for the body, pray for your own self, just as we come into a new year, the ways that we can live and be light um, to the world. And if you're here visiting with us, again, this, the giving is a family activity. If you're online, we, we always have a number of people online new. Um, that's a family activity. We don't expect you to do that. That's just something we do. So let's take a minute of silence. Go to the Lord in prayer. Pray for the Mitchells. Among other things, would you end that time by asking the Spirit, opening your heart, to receive whatever he has to say to you this morning through his word. All right, let's pray.
Father, thanks for just a, a minute of silence to stop and to breathe you in and to recenter ourselves on you. We do pray for the Mitchells for the upcoming trip, for the students that are going, that you would provide opportunities um, for them to share the gospel while they're there. And Lord, especially we're the day after Christmas, and there's just been a lot of loss around here lately, and we just think of the people who um, have just been through a pretty rough month, a rough day yesterday, so we just pray for those that are grieving the loss of somebody in their family, that you would um, strengthen them and give them your grace. And now, Lord, we are going to be hearing your word, and we want to be open and responsive, so give us ears to hear eyes to understand, give us feet to do, to walk in your way. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, I'm going to light a few candles over here. And as soon as I do that, I'm going to invite David Wooth to come up. See if this is the one that died the other night. Nope, it works. I might light this one too. I should leave that one alone. Would you all stand? David is going to read the word of the Lord for us out of Revelation chapter 12. I'm reading out of the NIV. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and she cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times and a half time, out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Nice catch, huh? Did you see that? Um, 
So, you, if you want to, you can open your Bible to Revelation 12. We, if, on the way in, if you got a sheet, this might be important because I'm going to explain it a little bit. This John structured Revelation 12 in a really specific way that helps us to understand kind of what's going on. So if you want to follow along with that, I think that will help you a lot. If you don't have one, you might raise your hand and we will, we will somehow, I see Heidi, if you could hold a hand up if you are wanting a sheet, um, hold your hand up high and we will get those to you. Thank you, Melissa, Richard. Um, so we, I mean, we're almost done with reading through the New Testament. Um, through the book of Revelation. Yeah, keep those hands up. And we're going to be looking today at Revelation chapter 12. Um, are you, here's my question, are you having fun in Revelation? Yeah, how many of your, your head is spinning? You know, once you get past kind of chapter 5, it's like, yeah, what is going on? What's all of this? Um, you're not alone. Um, but let me, I want to set the table for why Revelation, <clears throat> why it's so important. Um, John wrote this to Christians, and God was revealing himself through John to Christians who were suffering severe persecution. Um, a lot of believers, especially in Turkey, were being killed um, under the, the Caesar and under his local officials. And they were asking a lot of questions like, what's going on? Isn't God in control? Why does evil seem to be triumphing? And they were needing answers to those questions, and they were really struggling. Some of them had kind of given up hope. And so God, through John, decided to speak to them in that situation through a very unique form of literature that was very common for Jewish people. So all the Jew Jewish believers all through the churches in the Mediterranean world would have understood kind of what this literature was about. And we, what we call it, um, the literature is called apocalyptic. And so again, it was very common to them. So even the Gentiles who may not have totally understood this would have had Jewish believers in the congregations to help explain. But I just want to give you a little bit of background about apocalyptic literature. This helps a little bit in understanding or how you approach Revelation. Um, that word in, um, comes from the Greek, and it was a word that they used back then, and it means an unveiling. It's an opening of curtain. Letting you see something that is unseen to regular eyes. So what you can imagine is, imagine what everything was going on with those believers and all the persecution. They were living life on this main stage, like on a, in a theater or in a play. And they're asking, like, what is going on? We thought Jesus was victorious. Why are we being killed? What's happening? And in the book of Revelation, what's happening is God is unveiling that there's a greater reality. So imagine above this stage, there's a second stage. You're to play and suddenly a curtain goes back and there's actors up here. And when you see what's going on up here, it helps you to understand better what's going on down here. So it's, it's the great unveiling is what it is. And specifically, it is the revelation, and it is plural. When I became a new believer at our church, they always call it revelations, so I called it that for maybe the first five or six years that I was a believer, but it's, it's the revelation of Jesus, and it's really showing what Jesus is doing in the world, and many times in ways that are unseen to us. Um, apocalyptic literature is chock full of imagery, symbolism, and metaphor, so be careful. Don't take too much of that stuff literally, because if you do, it's really going to mess with you. It's in there intentionally to be symbolic. Some of it is very universal. Some of the symbols in there are things that even we can understand. In today's text, we see crowns on heads. Um, that meant to them political power. It would still mean that to us today. A lot of it was very common in their particular cultural setting. So that's why being able to have a commentary or some, a book that helps you understand some of the culture around them. Um, because these, a lot of these image, images were really common to them, especially this image of a dragon and of a prophesied child and the dragon trying to kill the child. There were stories very similar in Egypt, in Canaan, Babylon, in Greece, and in Rome. So this, this imagery was actually very common to them. Um, this idea of, like, of a dragon. And even we have stories. I won't tell you too many of them. But even um, the Chronicles of Narnia is about a prophesied lion who will come back, right? There's a prophecy of him and he comes and there's the, not a dragon, but the great white witch. So we even have some of this imagery, even today, again, kind of universal. The Old Testament is really important in understanding Revelation because a lot of the imagery, and you, if you, as we go through this text, you will see references to the Old Testament in here. And I only put the key ones there are multiple references to the Old Testament throughout this. And so knowing the Old Testament is really helpful. 
And that's part of the reason for our reading plan next year. For those of you that are continuing, we're, going to, we're starting in the Old Testament so that when you read it, you'll be like, yeah, I remember. I saw in Revelation reference that. It, so it's helpful to know the Old Testament. Numbers carry a lot of significance in apocalyptic literature, very significant in their time. The number seven was the number of something being complete or completion. The number 10 means the same thing, complete or completion. Anytime you see a seven or a 10 or a multiple, like 100,000, 10,000, 1,000, it references something being complete. Um, the, number seven, the number 12 represents the people of God. It could be the old covenant people because there were 12 tribes of Israel. It could be the new covenant people. There were 12 disciples. And anytime you see something that's divisible by 12, like in Revelation 4, 24 elders around the throne, that represents the totality of the people of God, Old Testament and New Testament. Does that make sense? When you see 144,000, that's divisible by 12. And it's, kind of, it's, it's like a number, it's like I think 1,000 or 10,000 multiplied. And it's the idea of God's people complete. So don't, don't worry about too much about that. But those are some important numbers that we're going to see um, actually today. And the other thing I would say that I think is really important in understanding, well, too, but apocalyptic is apocalyptic is about the big picture. So don't get too focused on the details because if you try to get in and understand, like, who are those two witnesses and they're what? They're shooting what out of their eyes and what's going on? If you get too focused on details, you'll get bogged down. The whole point of apocalyptic is the big picture. So always keep the big picture in mind. Don't lose the forest for the trees. And that really has to do with John's purpose. And the purpose of apocalyptic literature in general, it was intended to give hope for people who were in difficult times. And so by showing this upper, this upper um, not theater, but stage that's happening and what's going on and what, how everything will end, the intent is to give them hope, to hang in there. Because God will become, will be victorious in the end. He will eventually triumph over evil. So uh, don't get too weirded out by it. The whole purpose of it is to leave you with a sense of hope. And if you keep the big picture in mind, it'll do that. If you get in the bog down in the details, you'll get frustrated and weirded out, right? So we want to keep the big picture. So we come to Revelation 12, and I need to set it up a little bit. Three ways I want to set it up. First of all, I want to talk about the main characters. So in Revelation, John has been, in the first five chapters, he's setting up the main characters who are in this whole, these two stages, the whole, all the characters that are, are involved. And so in chapter one, he goes to this upper stage and he shows us Jesus, the messianic king, the lion of Judah. And that, that, that I don't know if your triad talked about it, ours was like, can you imagine the picture of the, the sword coming out of his mouth and all of that stuff, right? That's all imagery, but it's showing him in his um, as the king. And then you get the chapters two and three, and it's the letters to the seven churches. They're the second main players in this drama that's going on. So they're down here on this stage primarily, the letters to the churches. And then you get to chapter four, and again, he pans up here, and he shows us the throne room of God. And so God the Father is shown as one of the main characters sitting on the throne, and no matter what looks like is happening here, he's reigning up there. And then you get to chapter five, and remember, they bring out the scroll with the seven seals, and they can't find anybody worthy to open it. And the one who is worthy is, do you remember, is who? The Lamb of God. So it is Jesus as the suffering servant. Again, so we see a second image of Jesus as the Lamb is introduced in chapter 5. Then chapter 6 to 11 goes through, um, I think it's the bull judgment. Is it the bulls that are first? or the seal? It's the seals that are first. Kind of goes through those. And then we get to chapter 12. And after he's talked a little bit about what's some of the stuff that's going on behind the scenes in 6 to 11, he reveals the final and the main other main character in this drama. And that other main character is the great dragon. It is Satan. Before chapter 12, there's been some conflict going on. We've seen Satan reference in chapters 2 and 3, just his name dropped in. But now we're told more clearly the role that he plays. So chapter 12 is really significant in introducing the main antagonist um, that's behind all of the persecution and the stuff that they're going through. Okay. Second thing about Revelation 12. It is structured in a chiasmus. We talked about this when we did Romans 9, 10, 11. How the top and the bottom match and it kind of goes in. And anytime Jewish people wrote this way, the center was the most important part. And we're going to come to that in a little bit. So just want to make sure we get that. And then finally... 
I need to say this, that almost all commentators are agreed that Revelation 12 is the very center of the book, that this actually is the key story that helps us understand everything that's going on in the book of Revelation. Um, one commentator has said that chapter 12 is the master key to unlocking the message of the entire book. And what is introduced in chapter 12 is this great spiritual battle. That's what's introduced in chapter 12. This great war that's playing out not just on the human stage, but also in the earthly stage that is kind of a two-front battle. And so what we find in chapter 12 of Revelation is the full Christmas story. And I've been waiting for almost a year um, to teach this because this chapter is the unveiling of everything that was going on Christmas Day, of everything that was going on. Not that what Matthew and Luke tell us about Christmas Day wasn't true or wasn't going on, but they tell us, the, they kind of show us the earthly view. And then what John does in Revelation is he said, there was much more going on in Bethlehem that day 2,000 years ago. And I want to show you the bigger panorama of what it was. And so he gives us the, few, the full picture. And so as we jump into this, um, I'm going to use a thing that I heard growing up a lot. Please don't be offended if you're grandma, because I'm married to a grandma, Okay. The story, the Christmas story we're going to look at in Revelation 12, this is not your grandma's Christmas story, okay? It's not your grandma's Christmas story. We're going to find out that there was a huge war going on behind the scenes. This pitched spiritual battle was happening of cosmic epic proportions. I mean, look at the words, the words that permeate the text in verse, 12, in verse 7. I've got them in red. The word war is there. You see the word fought two times on the sheet. If you drop down to verse 17, wage war is there. Triumph is in verse 11. So those are all words of war. So this really is about the great war that was going on when Jesus was born. So I want you to think about it for a minute. All of our Christmas imagery, and, and there's nothing wrong with this, but all of our Christmas imagery is based on Matthew 2 and Luke 2, right? All of it. I've never seen any of our Christmas stuff portraying Revelation 12. I mean, if you think of all the, the famous classical paintings of the nativity, the Christmas cards we get, if you're at a store, a window display, think of the, our nativity sets at home, right, that we have. They're all quiet, they're peaceful, they're warm, there's sheep, cows, there's goats, there's the donkey, right, wise men, shepherds, there's Joseph, Mary, the baby Jesus, there's this angel hovering over. I mean, even some of the things we have are cute, right? Um, this is what we bought our kids long, long ago that we, we would put out every Christmas. And again, there's nothing bad about that. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I want you to know and leave here today is that's not the full story of Christmas. That's not the full story of Christmas. There's much more going on. In fact, how many of you noticed the dragon in the wreath that I put in there? I hope he's not melting. I was afraid of one of those candles melting his face. Yeah, there's a dragon hiding in our Christmas. Okay, so the stage is set. Are you ready to dive into chapter 12? Because this is rich. Are you ready? Two of you are ready? I think a few of you are ready. Let's do it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with the first four verses because this sets the stage. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, a crown of 12 stars on her head, she was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten hordes and seven crowns on its head. So here are the three main characters of the story are introduced. There's first the dragon. That's Satan, the devil, the serpent from Genesis 3 at the very beginning who tempted the man and woman and got them to reject God and, and brought brokenness and evil into our world. The great deceiver, the trait most mentioned of him throughout the Bible is his deception. And you notice the seven crowns and then the tens, all the sevens and tens and the crowns. What that's saying is, is complete political power on the earth is under his power. Does that make sense? He is influencing every government, every political power, power on the globe, including the U.S., all right? No government is uh, removed from his influence. The second player is this woman. And I've done a lot of reading on this for the last couple of weeks, and um, I am personally convinced, and it seems like it seems to be the consensus of most commentators, that this is referring to Israel, not to Mary. Um, here are some reasons why. 
There are two other women mentioned in Revelation. There is the great prostitute of Babylon in chapter 17, which we just read about yesterday. And then there's going to be another woman introduced at the end of the book who is the bride, which represents the church. So all the other women in Revelation represent corporate identities, okay? And again, everything is symbolic. So we, instead of like trying to get it down to a, to a narrow thing, you try to think, what's the symbolism? But there's actually some Old Testament references in this whole text that tells us that this is Israel. Um, in verses 6 and 14, I've got these kind of shadowed. You see the word wilderness, right? When you see that word wilderness, you immediately think of Israel leaving Egypt, being delivered from their bondage, and they go, and they're in the wilderness. Um, not only that, eagle's wings are mentioned, and I don't know that I, I probably didn't, um, um, didn't make that shadow, but the eagle's wings are mentioned in verse 14. And this is also an Old Testament revelation from both Exodus and Deuteronomy. That it says God carried them from Egypt into the wilderness on eagle's wings. So we see this Old Testament reference. She has 12 stars, right? And 12 represents what? The people of God. It's either Israel or it's, it's the church. But if she's giving birth to the Messiah, it would be Israel. It would be Israel. Um, but not only that, this is also a reference, and I have it on here, to Joseph's vision from Genesis chapter 37, verses 9 to 10, where he had a vision where the sun and moon would bow to him, and then all of his brothers who represent Israel, because his father is Jacob, who became Israel. So his father and mother would bow to him and all of his brothers, and it's using this exact same imagery. So this woman represents Israel. Specifically, she represents the true, faithful, believing remnant of Israel. Because a, a lot of that nation were lost. So she represents the true faithful believing remnant, the nation from whom the Messiah come, and Mary would be included in that remnant. And then the third person is the child. And it's pretty clear. It tells us who that is. We know it's Jesus the Messiah. Um, that is a quote of Psalm 2.9, which is a messianic psalm, and it speaks of the mess Messiah as the coming king. So those are the three main characters. Now the battle starts in, in verse 4. So it says there, the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Okay, so stop there. So the battle begins. His whole focus is on the child, the destruction of the child, right? She gives birth, so Israel, finally Messiah comes. He lunges to destroy the child, seeking the child's destruction. And we know frequently, because that's what these people were experiencing, they were being killed by Roman officials. That frequently Satan does his work through human intermediaries who incarnate his purposes. And so what is that reference, his trying to destroy the child? He's going back to Matthew 2, and he's talking about when Herod had heard about the Magi. Remember the Magi come? And they say, hey, we're here because your king, the Messiah, is born, and we're going to go worship him. And he, it says he was greatly troubled in his spirit. And so he asked the scholars, where's the Messiah going to be born? And, so, and they asked. So they say, Bethlehem. The Magi go there. He says, would you come back? Please tell me his name and his address because I want to go worship him. And they go and give him the gifts. And then a, an angel appears and says, don't go to him. You go home a different way. And when he realizes they've not come back, he's even more agitated. He sends troops and has every male child, two and a half years and younger, slaughtered in Bethlehem and then in the region around it. And so Satan, though Herod is the face of it, with this unveiling, we realize that Satan is the one who's really behind him trying to destroy and devour that child. It's Satan who's bent on his destruction. But look at verse 5. Verse 5. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Let's stop there. So he's snatched up to God and to his throne. Satan's thwarted in his attempt. He's unable to, to, to destroy Jesus, the Messiah. His, he's robbed of his prey. And what's interesting is, throughout the book of Revelation, John is primarily interested in the exalted Jesus, who's up here, the exalted Jesus. So he takes the whole life of Jesus. He's born and snatched up, and he compresses it all, and he just basically talks about the ascension after Jesus' resurrection, going back to heaven. So he just compresses his life, talks about his ascension, where he is enthroned as the ruler of the universe up here. So he just compresses Jesus' life. Um, and then verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. I'm going to come back to that in a minute when we get down to verses 13 um, and 14, or 14 to 16. So now verse 7, 
the battle really starts to rage. And here's what we're told in verse 7. Then, so after he is ascended, and then the woman is taken away to be safe, then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. Do you not love that word? It occurs, I think, four times in this text. He's hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here, but it is clear who, who is not victorious in the great battle. And it's the dragon. We're told in verse 8 that he was not strong enough against Michael and his angels. Two times in verse 9 that he is hurled down to the earth. All right, now let's, so let's skip this middle section, the song. Let's go down to C because see that this fits what we just read about the war. So in verse 13, he's coming back to that battle that's raging in the heavenly places. And there he just says, when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth. So it's a really short summary that he had been hurled to the earth. And so now let's finish, let's do 13, the rest of 13 to 16. He pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she could be taken care of. She would be taken care of for a time, times and half a time. That's from Ref, that's from Daniel. Out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her with a, away with a torrent. But the earth helped the woman by dragging its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So here's the key. He tries to destroy Messiah. He lives his life. He, he, is, he ascends to heaven where he's enthroned. There's this great battle in heaven that he loses. And now he turns his attention to the woman. Okay, He turns his attention to the woman because he didn't get the prey that he really wanted. And this has all happened after Jesus' ascension. So this is no longer the believing remnant of Israel. Who would this represent now? Yeah, it would be the church. And probably specifically, because it's still using Israel imagery, it's probably referring to the Jewish church, the Messianic believers who live in Israel. And we actually know that there's truth to that, because this 1260 days, we know that Rome... There became a civil war going on between Israel and Rome, and for three and a half years, there was this kind of battle thing going on, and a, a, somebody in the early Jewish church got a prophecy from the Lord to leave Israel because Rome was going to destroy Jerusalem, and so the Messianic believers in Israel crossed the Jordan, went to a town called Pella, we're told by two church historians about this, and they escaped, and when Rome destroyed Israel and Jerusalem and dispersed the Jews, they never crossed over to that part to where the Jewish church was at, and so they were actually protected from them. So it actually fits history. Okay, but I don't want to focus so much on, the woman, on that, because what I want to get to is the most important part, which is the middle. The middle, which is the crux of the passage. Um, remember, the most important part of a chiasmus is that center section, Right? And so let's focus on that center section because here in the very middle of Revelation 12, in the middle of the book of Revelation, is this song that's sung in heaven. And it contains all the main themes of this chapter, all the main themes of the book of Revelation, and really all the main themes of the whole Christmas story. So can we read it together? So here's what John says. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now have come the salvation and the power. I, I just love these words. Now have come... The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. Man, I just love the strength of that. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night, he has been, there's that word again, what? Hurled down. Man, I love that word hurled. Verse 11, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their, tes their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Rejoice, because he's been hurled down, and they have triumphed. So at the center of this chapter, at the center of this great battle story, at the center of revelation, is this key theme that those early Christians needed to hear so desperately that that it's, it's a mess down here, but up there, we want you to know that the Lord Jesus Christ triumphs. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that powerful? That he triumphs over Satan. A triumph, we're told, that's won first and foremost through his blood, through his death, 
his burial, his resurrection, his defeat of Satan, and of his power. As Paul says in Colossians 2.15, Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and the authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them on the cross. So the victory is defeated first through his blood, and secondly, this is what's really interesting, a triumph that's won secondly through the word of their testimony. Revelation 1, 2, and 1, 9 talks about this testimony. It's called the testimony about Jesus. And you guys have all heard, I mean, most of you probably, giving your testimony. So a person comes to faith in Jesus, and as they bear witness to him, and as they share with people, they're coming to faith and how he has changed their lives and transformed them and forgiven them of their sins. And as they see a difference in their life, that testimony is something that is part of the defeat of Satan. Because through that testimony, as other people come to Jesus, then more people are taken out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. And slowly and slowly, more and more people from all nations are robbed from his territory and brought into the territory of the true king. And that's how we triumph. Isn't that awesome? I just, I just, love, I just love this text. Now, that brings me to an obvious question. So if Satan's defeated... This is what even they would ask, and I think today we can ask. If Satan's defeated, why do we still see him so actively involved in the world, so actively against the people of God and the plans of God? Was Jesus' death not enough? And I've said this a couple years ago, but I'm going to say it again. That the New Testament is clear that Jesus' death and resurrection was the decisive victory over Satan. It's the the decisive victory. And I need to define that decisive victory for you. A decisive victory is a military victory that definitively resolves the war, where the enemy is essentially defeated and where the ultimate outcome of the war war is assured. In World War II in Europe, that was D-Day. When that battle was won, that is what determined who would win the war. That was the decisive battle. But in the interim, between the decisive battle and the final victory, the final defeat of the enemy, there is still a lot of hard-fought, bloody battles with with casualties. And that's what happened in Europe. And it's the same in the spiritual realm. Jesus won the decisive victory over Satan on the cross, and three days later when he rose from the dead. But though defeated decisively, Satan and his legions are still fighting tooth and nail to get as much territory as they can in their last grasp grasp effort to hold on long-held territory. And that's, if we go back to the second half of verse 12, that's why we read this. In verse 12... It says, there, um, but, so all that good news, but woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you and he is filled, filled with what? He is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. Look at verse 17 where we're told in the blue that the dragon was what? Was enraged. He is angry at this defeat. So while defeated, he is still powerful. He's still fighting bitterly to the end. Like any strong enemy, he's not going to go down without a fight, right? Swinging till the end. Um, Frequently, when somebody's losing, they will take on a strategy of an all-out campaign of utter destruction, right? Well, if I'm going to lose this game, you're all going to lose this game, right? That kind of thing. And so it is with Satan. As he goes down in his last gasp attempt, he's going to wreak on this stage, this earthly stage, as much havoc as he can. And he's going to take as many people down with him as possible. Okay, now that we've got the center, let's go down to 17 where this story ends. And I've been waiting on this last verse because it's a really important part of the story. And it's where we come in the picture. It's where we enter this story. Verse 17, then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. So having failed in his attempt to destroy Jesus the Messiah, to destroy that initial Jewish church, that remnant who who accepted him as Messiah, who God hid away in Jordan, in his failed attempt at that, he's like, I'm getting the rest of them. And so he began to wage war on the global church, on everybody, the rest of her offspring, all the people who have accepted him as their Lord and Savior, who follow him, who are being transformed by him, that he's like, I'm going to go after all of those people. All the believers globally and all throughout history. And I want you to know included in the rest of the offspring is us. We're in that. We're right now living on this stage, right? 
and there is a great dragon who's still so angry and enraged that he will do anything to destroy you and me and this body, right? He'll do anything. So when he wrote this, this was this, the early church was in this drama. But now we're a part of this drama. This is our story. And so this is why I love this chapter and what I've been thinking about. Do you realize that we are in a pitched battle? Do you really know deeply in your heart that we are participants in the greatest war that's ever gone on in the history of the universe? And if you're like me, many of us live our lives just ho-hum day to day, just life, things are going on, right? Living, frankly, totally unaware that there's a battle raging against us and that there is an enemy who is out to get us. How often I forget about that. I think how many times we live like the hobbits in the Shire or the ensign Fanghorn Forest who are totally oblivious to the fact that there is an enemy bent on total dominion of that whole realm and on total destruction, totally clueless that there's something going on around them. We in the Western church struggle with, if, we, if, if uh, the Mitchells were here, they would tell us this, we struggle with um, what's called the excluded middle. That most people around the world, they live with this very acute awareness. That's really hard to see. The middle part's supposed to be a little darker, but they, they live with this very acute awareness that there's kind of life here, that there is this highest God, but that there is this whole spiritual world between the two that influences us. People all over the world in other places live with this reality. They understand it. It's continually in their mind. But we tend to live as if it's just me down here and God up there, and I think we just live so much without a real awareness of that middle, of that spiritual territory. Paul speaks of that middle in Ephesians 6, 12, when he says this, and that's probably hard to read. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So here's, as I'm looking at this text, here's my message to myself and to all of us. We've got to, to wake up, right? That's what he said to Sardis twice in chapter 3. Wake up. There is more going on than you realize. Satan is ferocious. And in the words of 1 Peter 5, 7, he is like a lion walking about, a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. His intent is to devour people. So yes, Christmas is a time to rejoice. It is. It's a time to sing carols. It's a time to put up the Christmas tree put up decorations and light. It's a time to give gifts. That's all appropriate. Um, it's a time to put lights around the house, to make Christmas cookies and peanut brittle and chocolate fudge, to drink hot chocolate and apple cider. We should be doing all of that. It's a time to laugh and enjoy family and friends and have all around merriment, to put up our nativity scenes, to celebrate the coming of the king. That is what Christmas is about. But let us not lose the story behind the story. Let's not lose that story. There was a great battle raging behind the scenes on that night 2,000 years ago. A great battle was going on. In the words of Philip Yancey, that was not a silent night. It was the cosmic D-Day. It was the cosmic D-Day. It was a spiritual Normandy. Bethlehem was the Omaha Beach of the greatest war ever fought. Because on that day in Bethlehem, in the words of C.S. Lewis, God was establishing a beachhead on earth to reclaim what was rightfully his. So, a few thoughts about what to do with this. Um, one is this. Perhaps, this is something I've done for about five years now, five or six. Perhaps you can add to your Christmas tree decorations, a small dragon. We've got lots of nativity stuff on our tree, but for about five or six years, I found a little dragon. It's a Playmobil dragon that's a perfect size that I put up in the top of the tree. He's kind of back in the branches, not so easy to see, but to, to remind me, even when I do that, that he is lurking and that the full Christmas story is not just the birth of Jesus to save us. It is that, but it's also the story of a great battle. 
So maybe that's something you could do. Just a small reminder to us and to our children that we are at war and that Christmas Day was a declaration of war. Another thing to do. I know the McCrory's um, do this. Brent and I talked about it. I did it yesterday for the first time. But on Christmas Day, if you read the Christmas story, so when we did the Advent yesterday, we were reading Luke, the, Chris, the Luke story, and then we read Revelation 12. So maybe it's adding Revelation 12 to your reading every Christmas. Um, you might wait till your children are a little older, okay? I'm not sure how much they would kind of get that, or it might freak them out. Um, and, but, and don't stick this thing around your house. That for little children, that could really cause <laughs> problems. All right, my application, three things I really want to challenge you and myself. Number one is vigilance. We need to be vigilant. Jesus at Gethsemane, just before his crucifixion, when Satan's trying to do that death blow on him, right? He tells his followers, he says, this is the hour when evil is going to reign supreme. This is it. Darkness is here in its fullness, and it's out for me. And his command to them is, watch and pray. Watch and pray. Vigilance. In the words of First Peter 5, be sober and on the lookout for that lion. You know, keep your head about you. Keep your eyes open. Don't forget the spiritual middle. Watch and pray. Regularly pray those words of the Lord's Prayer. Lord, deliver us from the evil one. I mean, he gave that as a model prayer. And if you take that as a model for daily prayer, every day we should be thinking about the spiritual battle. So, Lord, deliver us. C.S. Lewis, I've done a lot of C.S. Lewis today. In a letter... Um, to a young man wrote this, the enemy will not see you vanish into God's company without an effort to reclaim you. He's not just going to let you go. Scott, I don't know, you're here close. You've been a believer how long? 50 years. He hasn't said, I'm done with that guy, 50 years following Jesus, right? He's still out for us, seeking to reclaim us. But I do want to add this. Don't get so wrapped up that you start seeing the devil behind every bush, okay? I, don't do that. Because C.S. Lewis also said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. That's that forgotten middle, right? The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves, so Satan is equally pleased by both heirs, and he hails both with the same delight. He is just as happy with the person who doesn't realize he's running around wreaking havoc as he is with the person that's so focused on him that they see the devil in everything. Okay? He enjoys both of those. So while we are vigilant, though, our focus is not on Satan. Our focus is on who? It's on Jesus, and it's on the advancement of his kingdom. Because Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church and upon this rock, uh, that location, sometime I'll preach on that. It's amazing. That was actually, he was at a rock. It's, it's really cool. But here, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell, Satan's own gates will not be able to prevail against, they won't be able to withstand the church's attack. So we keep our focus on our mission, being vigilant, but our focus is on Jesus, okay? We don't become like just seeing the devil everywhere. So second, so be vigilant. Second, arm yourself. Ephesians 6, Paul talks about putting on the full armor of God. And I'd like to do a series at some point through that. But the thing that's common in almost all those pieces of armor is the word of God. If we delved into it, that's why we've been reading the New Testament this year. Because I wanted this body in the word of God every day. So get in the word of God daily. Do the Old Testament reading next year. Stay in the word of God. That's how you arm yourself against him. Because again, his number one tactic is deception. So if you're in the truth, you're less likely to be deceived. So the word of God is important. And then finally, I can't end, end a sermon on Revelation, an apocalyptic book that is intended to give hope without a message of hope. So be encouraged. Don't let this frighten you. Don't let this discourage you, all this talk of this great dragon, because 
The point of the book of Revelation, the point of chapter 12, is the fact that Jesus will triumph over him. That's verse 11. They triumphed over him, and therefore, in verse 12, we are to rejoice. That's the whole point, is in the end, Jesus wins. Yes, we're in a war right now, but he's not going to be triumphant. I may even lose my life. Unlikely, but I might, because they were. But the point is, we just read this a few chapters back. Even God's people will be vindicated in the end. It talked about the fact that the people will see those who loved, will see those who, who knew Jesus, and it says they will know that God loved them. So finally, there will be that vindication of all of us. And so we should be encouraged, because in the words of 1 John 4:4, 4, 4, where he says, "You dear children, are from God, and you have overcome." Have we not seen that a lot in the book of Revelation, that overcoming language? You have overcome, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world." So in the words of Eugene Peterson. I really love this. We remain dauntless and unimpressed by dragon bluster. Isn't that good? Yes, he's raging, but we're unimpressed. We keep following Jesus. And even if we have to give our life, he will be the great victor. And in the end, he will triumph and we will be here with him. So if I were to summarize, there is a great war going on. But I want to tell you, the enemy's been defeated. He's been defeated. We have triumphed and Jesus has triumphed. Evil won't have the final say. God and goodness will win in the end. Is that not good news? That's why the whole story of Jesus is called good news. So I end with verses 10 and 11. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. I, I want to do that again. I didn't do it right. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night, he has been hurled down, and they, we, triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And as we're going to sing here in a minute, I'm going to have you stand. Go ahead and stand. We're going to sing this. We're going to sing one of the great hymns that's ever come from the church, written by Martin Luther, that great reformer. The name is A Mighty Fortress. And I had kind of forgotten until we were doing our New Testament reading this year, and he, they quoted A Mighty Fortress in one of our insights. And when I was reading it, I'm like, that's all about the spiritual battle, that song. And I love that song, and so we're going to end with that. But I want to read the third verse, because I love the words. And through this world... With devils filled, though they should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. I love this last line. One little word will fell him. When Jesus comes, one word totally triumph over him. Isn't that powerful? So can we end with worship and sing this song? And you can't sing this after Revelation 12 just casually, right? <laughs> let's sing it, like really focusing on the words, and let's sing it with some gusto as people who've triumphed and rejoice. Amen. We have a psalm that we're gonna to read together, kinda of introduce the song. So will you read with me? This comes, on, I can't remember what psalm it is, 18 I think. Yeah, okay. You've trained me with the weapons of warfare worship. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You empower me for victory with your wraparound presence. Your power within me makes me strong to subdue. By stooping down in gentleness, you made me great. You've set me free, and now I'm standing complete, ready to fight some more. I caught up with my enemies and conquered them and didn't turn back until the war was won. Amen. Like Jesus said, we will have trouble. We will have suffering. There's been so much loss. There's been death this year in this church. 
and there's suffering we still go through and we will go through, but he has won the war and we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Sing this out with gusto. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient chapter not so rich i love that chapter i love revelation so as we finish up this week jordan and i next week we'll be talking about the very last two chapters new creation i'm excited about that so 12th you know every week we try to send you so this week we want you sent with that awareness of what's going on but sent in a spirit of triumph and sent to share your testimony there are people who so badly need to hear of how you've encountered jesus because that's part of the defeat of the enemy so can i pray for us father thank you for this rich 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 chapter, this rich book, and the important truths it conveys. And thank you that it gives us the hope that in the end you will triumph, that you are victorious, though there is a great battle, and we feel it. I feel it in my life. Lord, sometimes you, f you feel him tugging at the church. Um, Lord, that you will be triumphant. And so help us to be vigilant. Help us to put on your armor, to be in your word, but to be encouraged. 
And Lord, help us to be people who share our testimony with those around us because that's part of how we triumph over him. And we pray this in your name, Jesus, the triumphant one. Amen. Amen. So 12th, Merry Christmas a day after, and you are sent.